Welcome to part two of our interview with paranormal investigator Daryl Marston about the haunted House of Wills. I guess my next question would be, what drew you back? Uh, obviously, intrigue, but with that, that much that happened, what made you say, that's a good idea? Okay, well, it's a, it's a, it's a, I'm going to make a, a long story short. I got invited back. We were going to do one, two, three, five investigations over like a three-day period. Mm -hmm. We were going Bobby Mackey's to Damsville, Mansfield, uh, and Madison Seminary, so four. We happened to be going through Cleveland, and they're like, hey, let's stop at the House of Wills. Let's call Patty and go in the House of Wills. I'm like, oh, man. I was like, I don't know about this. So, dude, we're 10 minutes away. So I'm like, all right, make the phone call. So I made the phone call. I literally sat outside that building for a good 25, 30 minutes before I would even walk in it. I, I just sat down. I was like, I can't do this. I can't go back in this building. And then everybody else started going out. I was like, all right, I'm going in. So I went in with everybody else. But I tell you, when I went in the second time, it was, day, it was daytime, probably two or three in the afternoon, and we were in there with Patty. Um, it took on a, a little bit of a different vibe. I didn't feel as, as threatened, but I didn't walk around the building either. I stayed in, like, this one hallway, and I just, like, I kind of looked around. I was in there for about 20 or 30 minutes, and I just, I didn't do the whole investigation on that one. I said, let's go, because we were on our way to Madison Seminary to do an investigation that night anyway. So, um... Yeah, that was the whole reason I went in the second time. I told them I would never go back in that building, and they got me back in it probably about a year later. Um, and then we went back in. Well, I have not been back since, but my teammates have been back there several times because, like I said, they live about an hour outside of Cleveland. I live in Delaware, so I'm like nine, ten hours away. Mm -hmm. um, but we did a live feed from there in June. So, yeah, we've been back since, and, and the live feed was just the, the, the evidence was captured was amazing what happened with the live feed what sort of evidence did you capture um, okay well we had a SLS this time um a couple different echo boxes that were you know a little bit better i, I should say spirit boxes that were better they're kind of hooked up to an echo box they're kind of handmade ones but they're very loud um the sos or the connects whatever you want to call it Oh my God, we caught the most, I mean, 10 minutes into the building, uh, they're filming. I'm at home base, uh, actually doing the live feed from here in Delaware, where they're in, in the house of wills. So it's all, it's being broadcast live on paranormal warehouse and there's thousands of people watching. Um, the SOS captures this, this figure sitting on a pew, like in the, there's an auditorium area. If in the, everybody's ever seen pictures, there's this huge auditorium in the house of wills. It's two stories high. And there's, there's some, uh, there's church pews that are still there. You, you capture this, this thing sitting in his church pew, just sitting there. And they start talking to it. And it looks, I mean, it, for a good 15, 20 minutes straight, this thing looks like it's almost like it's drunk. It's slouching over and, and coming up. It's responding to what they're, they're asking it. Um, they're asking different questions. Like, it, you know, because what they came up with was they thought maybe it was somebody from the Prohibition era or from the German Social Club, where there's a lot of drinking going on, a lot of party going on there. Um, it just looked like somebody, a drunk man or woman sitting there and just slouching over and, and coming back up and like answering their questions. It would slouch over again. So that was pretty cool. That was great. Oh yeah, we called that. But then at the end of the night, during the live feed, they're in the upstairs and there's a high chair, this high chair from the Turner Center. I wanna say it's probably 65, 70 years old. A high chair sitting upstairs for whatever reason. I don't know why it's there. And I'm not lying to you. Anybody can go back and watch this on Paranormal Warehouse on the archives. This childlike figure is sitting in the high chair, kicking its feet and responding to everything they're saying. I even talked out loud over the live feed because they could hear it and asked, do you remember me? And it, it called out my name, Daryl, on the live feed. Um, it was amazing. And this went on for almost a half hour. It got so, it, it got so long. I started getting bored with watching this damn thing, but and it finally just disappeared. But at the same time, we're getting responses out loud on the, um, on the recorders and on the, um, spirit box that they were using at the time. So it was amazing. It was, it, uh, it was astounding that we, we captured that on an actual live feed where people could see it. Do you think that, 
the entities that were showing themselves at that moment in time so frequently, so back to back, were they different entities or was it the same thing, almost changing shape and changing appearance? I want to say it was different. Okay. I mean, I'm not an expert when it comes to that, but I want to say it was different. Just the way the, the first one was more uh, sluggish and kind of you know, slouched over and it was more of a, the size of a grown up. Um, and when the the second one, it it could have been the same. Don't get me wrong. I don't yeah. I don't know if it could change shapes or whatever. And the second one was with the size of a probably like a two or three year old child sitting in a high chair, just doing their thing, kicking their legs back and forth, th- thrashing their hands around like they're just throwing food everywhere, like a child does. Uh, it was just it was insane. I mean, I've never seen anything like that on any of the big shows. And this, just to put this visual in my mind of, of how this was being seen, was this being seen through the Connect type device, or was this being seen? Yeah. Ju- okay, so that's how it was being picked up. Yeah, so you're seeing this stick image. Yeah. You're seeing the people, you, you might see one or two people. There's four people there doing the, the live feed that were with, you know, on my live feed. Um, it was Patty um, and uh, another gentleman and my two investigators, uh, Britt and Greg. Mm-hmm. Um so you see this small stick figure, and every once in a while, if anybody knows anything about SLS or the Connects, you can actually, see, if you see a human, you can actually see their outline slightly, and then you see a stick figure too. This thing had no outline. It was just a stick figure of a child sitting in a high chair and just kicking away and doing its thing and having a good old damn time on our expense. But it was great. It was, it was yeah. I tell you what, man. I, I was so excited. I was like, there's no way this is happening right now. Yeah, and that's, that's not like a random anomaly either to have that sort of a stick no. figure showing up in the height chair. I mean, it, it's, it'd be one thing if it was just kind of like floating midair and you could make some arguments, well, maybe something this or that triggered it. But to right. be in that specific or on that specific object that's made for that specific type of a person, for that to be right there, that is very, very compelling. Yeah, and if anybody's interested, go look at the archives on Paranormal Warehouse back in June. You'll you can pull it up and we'll see the House of Wills and watch it. It's amazing. It's amazing footage. Yeah, and it really is. With the spirits that are there, that are because it sounds like there's several of them. Is there anything that leads you to believe that that they interact with one another? Are they kind of all on their own planes and not able to communicate? What's your thoughts there? I think they interact. I think they're very intelligent. They know they're there. I don't see a lot of residual things happening there, to be honest with you. I just, I don't see it. Um, the times I've been there, now I might be wrong. There might be some residual, but it seems like everything in that building is very intelligent. And it knows. I mean, it knew my name. And I hadn't been there in two years. It knew who I was. I said, did you, I asked it out loud over the uh, live feed. Do you remember who, who, you remember me? You remember when I was there? And it said, hey, it said, Daryl. Out loud. Yeah, Daryl. Like, okay, yeah, I, I remember who you are. I'm like, holy cow, dude, really? Are you serious right now? And it was just, it was mind blowing because I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm a skeptic. I believe in the paranormal. I'm going to go wrong, but I, I need to see it. I need, I need my hands on it, man. I need to see it. I need to have my hands wrapped around it for me to actually to to process it. And man, I wasn't even in the room, and I was processing everything that was going on that night. And I know how that building is. I know how it acts. It it shows you what it wants you, you know, to see. So it very well it could not. It may not have been a child sitting in that chair. It could have been something darker that's just messing with us. Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Who knows? That's the scary thing with with a, something like that. Do you think this is just completely an opinion based question? That the spirits that are there, do you think they all want to be there? I don't think they do, Tony. I really don't. I I. I I think some of them probably are stuck there. And I think some of them are stuck there. Um, they've been there for a long time, and they don't know any better. Uh, I think some of them probably do want to be there. I think whatever ones are feeding off that darkness that, that in that building, they're probably the ones that don't want to leave. Um, yeah, it, it, it's sad in some ways, because that, if that was a child that's there, I, I, I feel horrible, because no child needs to be in that damn building. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of those things where I, I, my experience is there's so many hauntings where I, I feel like it seems like they're pretty content that this is where they want to be. They don't want to be crossed over. They don't want to go through the light or whatever uh, the the living seem to think that they, they should be helping them do. But then you have cases right. like this where, you know, there's just a, an overwhelming sense of sadness. There may be some 
pieces to it where maybe this one is content to be here, but there's just an overwhelming darkness. And well, then, I, I that, could tell I could tell you, Tony, that I've never in the, the times I've been in that building, I've never felt sadness. I felt scared. Yeah, and I know a person scares very easily. I, there's places in that building I'm scared of. I will not go. I would not go by myself. And that's what rule we had when we were there. No one goes anywhere in this building by themselves. Simple as that. Now, I've been on many, many, many investigations all around this country, and I've had no problem. There's only one other place I had a problem doing that, and that was the Anderson Hotel. And it, I, it was a scene kind of darkness. Um, yeah, so I, I never felt sadness. I just always felt very scared and uneasy in that building. Almost like threatened type scared. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's 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 to a point where you think if you're by yourself, something bad is going to mm-hmm. pop out of the darkness and take you, man. I know it's not going to happen, but it's just that feeling you get. It's just it's scary as hell. It really is. Yeah, because I mean, there's there's different levels of scared and different you know feelings of being scared. They're scared of this is kind of eerie. This is kind of spooky. And then there's also scared of I'm walking through a you know almost like if you were outside of the <laughs> the house of wills, you're walking through a bad part of town in the middle of the night uh, with some sort yeah. of offensive thing written on your t-shirt that would uh, attract someone <laughs> to attack you. Um, you know, I mean, but, but you can also have that same feeling in in a haunted location. That same sort of fear for your own safety. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty bad because you're in East Cleveland. East Cleveland is no place to mess around. It's pretty bad when you'd rather be outside, yeah, and then be in that building. I mean, it's it's intense. I mean, it's intense. And and I always tell everybody, I said, if you're a first time investigator, even if you've only been doing this for a few months, do not go there. Do not go there. Do not go there. You do not want to go to that building because that's only for the people who've been doing this for a long time and know how to shake it because it will mess with your mind so bad what was the thing that that made you decide to say i i I want to to not go back here i'm i'm really am completely done with this well the the story i I tell everybody was when it when i came home for that first investigation and whatever it was was still attached to me it was not i wouldn't say the whole thing but a part of it was attached to me and it wreaked havoc on me for a good two to three weeks. Um, that's what told me not to go back there. The second time I went back there was just pure stupidity. I, we were in the area, and I and I I just caved in under peer pressure. Um, yeah, it's honestly I, I'm glad they're shutting it down. Uh, I, and and I hate to say that because it's such an amazing location for people to investigate. And so many people over the years I've talked to, they oh my God, we want to go, we want to go. People are hitting me up about it. How do you get in? I'm like, guys, I don't know if you really want to do this, but here's who you need to talk to. Um, I'm kind of glad because it's just, I, whatever that darkness is, it just needs to be left alone and, and let you know Eric deal with it uh, the way he deals. He loves the building. He, he Apparently he was living there for a while. Um, I don't know how anybody could live in there uh, just with that darkness, but he's a dark character himself. So I just say, yeah, I, I, I told myself I, I'm better than that. I just, I know, I know that if I, if I did live close to that building, I probably would be there a lot more. I probably would have been because I've been drawn to it and I'm glad I live, you know, eight, nine hours away. That way I'm not drawn to it. Like a lot of our locations that are around me that I'm drawn to that are not as dark. <laughs> sure. You had mentioned earlier that there were parts of the building that you almost just want to avoid, not only alone, Uh but obviously even with with a group. What are some of those areas of the building that are just just too intense and why? Uh, The sub-basement is very intense. Um, I got halfway down the stairs and wouldn't go any further. Besides the fact it's just very... um, it's very dark and very tense, um, and there's something down there. It just doesn't want you down there, but it's a lot of. There's a lot of other factors too. There's a lot of mold down there, and you can just feel it in the air when you, you're going down into the sub basement. Because sub basement, you're in a basement, and there's natural basement to a basement, which I've never seen before. Uh, it's just insane. Um, so yeah, the sub basement, uh, the basement period is pretty intense. It's just you you get a lot of really good EVPs down there. If you got any like uh, REM pods or K2s or millimeters, your millimeters and stuff, everything's going to be going off. 
the whole time you're down there. There's no power to the building, so it's not power. Um, it's no, you know, there's no electric in the building at all. You have to run generators the whole time you're there if you're running static cam. Um, and it's what, it's what we had to do. We had, we had to keep a generator in the garage area and run it the whole time just so our cameras would run and we could charge them. Um, the sub basement, the basement, and there's a couple rooms upstairs. Uh, there's a um, there's a room upstairs, the bar. A lot of people don't even know it's there. Um, as a matter of fact, I only know if like in the last couple of years you were able to get into the bar area because Eric had kind of quarantined that area off and made it to his living quarters. But there's a bar area that's very intense. That's where um, the one guy on our team got scratched. Um, he got you know the 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 traditional three scratches down the back, whatever the heck that's supposed to be. I don't know why you always get three scratches, but he did. And straight down the back, um, that's where I was cussed out over the Echo Box and over the SL, uh, the SB7 or whatever. Um, very intense areas. Uh, you're walking like, and I think the most intense area for me was, to be honest with you, was probably the auditorium. Now you got this huge auditorium, and but you're in there and we were playing, we, we started playing music from turn of the century, like out loud on the, um, on a, on a radio. Like we had a, a radio set up with a, a Bluetooth and everything. We started playing this turn of the century type, almost gospel music and all kinds of stuff, just stuff to try to stir stuff up. And it felt like you're in this, this spinning room, this giant spinning room. Like you're, it's almost like a, a a tornado and you're stuck in the middle of it and you see everything spinning. That was probably the room that really did a number on me out of all of them. And that's the same room where we caught on video, this black mass coming out of the ground and basically just standing there and watching us. And we caught on two separate cameras. And I actually put it out there a couple about a year or two ago. I put it out on Facebook and YouTube and stuff for people to watch and just get people's opinions on it. I said, I'm not saying this is paranormal. I'm not saying it is, and I'm not saying it's not. I said, I, we tried to debunk it. We can't debunk it. It was called on two separate cameras. This is what it is. You make of it what you need to. And we put it out there, and you got this black mass that's standing behind us at one point, which is probably six, six and a half foot tall. It almost looked like a reaper. So we put that out there. So, yeah, there are the areas of the building that are probably the darkest. Also, there's a room upstairs that's called the train room, where they used to have these little toy model trains. There's gigantic like wooden table where they used to run the trains on. That area is very intense too. It's, you don't see anything, but you just feel this, this tension when you're in that room. That's probably the darkest spot that I can remember. Wow. What would, and this is an opinion question, what are your hopes for the building? Where do you see the building in 10, 20 years from now? Or where would you like to see the building, if at all? Um... I can tell you Eric's doing a lot of work to it. He's been putting a lot of money into the building, trying to restore it back to the original. He's got a long road ahead of him. He's done a lot, believe me, uh, from the pictures I've been seeing and videos. I, I would like to see it restored back to its original form and, or, or close to it. Uh, it's a beautiful building, and it, it, it's such a rich part of Cleveland history that I don't want to see anything bad happen to it. Uh, I... I'm just hoping he gets it to where he wants and and he takes care of it. Cause I, I know he loves the building. You could tell by just talking to the guy how much he loves it. And I think he will. I think it's going to take time and it's going to take a lot of money and effort. But uh, I think he'll get it there. It might take, you know, like I said, five, ten years before it's back to its original form. But I, I just hope it, it stays there and, and becomes something you know, better and bigger than it was. Uh, I I'm hoping it comes something more open to the public and maybe that dark energy will leave or, you know, <laughs> I don't know where it's going to go, but <laughs> it, it, would, it would be nice to see it you know, become something for the public like yeah, he's been talking about doing. That wraps up part two of our interview with Daryl Marston about the House of Wills. Until next time for The Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.